Mr Hines, I so is, is the government preparing for a second referendum? No, a second referendum would be, uh, would be divisive. We had a, we've had the people's vote, we had the referendum, and now we've got to get on with, we've got to get on with implementing it. And any idea that having a second, second referendum now would sort of break through an impasse, I just think is wrong. It might postpone the impasse, but then it would extend it. So what we need to do is get on with this. The Prime Minister has been in Brussels, been talking to the different European leaders to help secure those extra reassurances that colleagues understandably are looking for on the backstop. But then we have, to, we have to get together again and we have, to, we have to support a balanced deal which gives us a good Brexit for Britain. You talked there about Theresa May's negotiation, but let's get real. Mm. I mean, it's not exactly been going to plan, has it? I mean, it doesn't look as if she's going to be getting any of the kind of assurances that she promised MPs before that vote of confidence. So you must have a plan B, surely. Is a second referendum something that is being discussed at Cabinet? Well, I think look, what we saw in Brussels this week, Thursday, Friday, I think was, it was an important start, but it's not, the, it's not the end of the process by any means. And the PM uh, will carry on those discussions o over the Christmas period and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back uh, in, in, in January. But, you know, we talk about a plan B. Uh, there are about half a dozen different options uh, sort of going around and all of them has their own strong supporters, uh, but none of them has a majority in favour. You know, whether you talk about Norway or Canada or second referendum or leaving without a deal or whatever it may be. And in the end, what we need is a balanced deal, something that, you know, can appeal to, obviously, to, to those who voted to leave, but also appeal to those who voted remain. It's got to be a deal for the whole country, a balanced deal. And the essence of what the, the Prime Minister has negotiated does, it, does exactly that. You know, it gets us out of free movement, gets us out of the common agricultural policy, but means we can strike trade deals and keep a close relationship economically and in other ways with Europe. And, you know, before the referendum, if you'd offered that deal, both to many, you know, leavers and many remainers, they, they would have bitten your hand off. It's a good deal. Uh, a very kind of impassioned defence of the Prime Minister's deal. The question was whether a second referendum has been discussed at Cabinet, though. Ha has it? No, we, no, our, our government policy is, I mean, couldn't be clearer. We are here to, uh, to act so on the will of the British cabinet? people. Cle cle no, no, we are here to act on the will of the, of the British people, clearly expressed in the referendum, but, you know, to do so in a way which takes a balanced approach and is good for people's jobs and livelihoods. And that's absolutely what the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are focused on. I mean, one way of breaking the deadlock, because it does feel as if we're in a bit of a gridlock here with, you know, the EU not moving, uh, Conservatives backing the Prime Minister to stay on as leader, but not saying they're going to change their minds uh, at the votes, is one way of breaking that deadlock, putting a, a series of votes to the House of Commons to try and work out what there could be a majority for? Well, I, what we need, I mean, as you sort of allude to, is people need to get beyond, um, you know, everybody's idea of what's my first choice, because there isn't a majority for any of those first choices. Instead, what you need is a balanced kind of approach. And, and when you go from, you know, when you pick apart your own first choice and start to think, well, well how, how would it work? Uh, something that, that would appeal more broadly, that balances all these different objectives. And some of our different objectives are, you know, there is a certain conflict between them. Um, when, when you go through that process, you get to something very close to the deal that the, that the Prime Minister has put forward. So, you know, we have to remember all that we have in uh, common, uh, what, the, what, what the essential objective is that we're trying to do here, to make sure we honour the result of the referendum, but do so in a way which is economically... It is economically beneficial. I think that over the Christmas period, you know, that's a time when we do think about all that we have in common and we think about our togetherness and we think about the future. This will be a good time, I hope, for everybody to reflect on that uh, so, that we can, uh, so that we can all come together in support of, of a good balanced deal. Um, at the same time, though, Christmas is also going to be meaning that uh, time for reflection, as you say, but also the clock ticking, uh, Brexit getting closer, the possibility yeah. of no deal uh, increasing as well. If we move to full no-deal planning, can you guarantee that money won't be diverted from the education budget in order to fund that? It's a direct question, so I'd, appre I'd appreciate a direct answer. Oh, yeah, I'll give you a very direct answer. Education is an absolutely top priority of the government. That's why it was one of the two domestic uh, budgets. You know, the 5 to 16 school budget was one of the two domestic budgets that's been protected since 2010 and we will absolutely uh, be protecting that on an ongoing basis. Uh, th that's not to say by the way that no deal isn't a serious is a very serious thing and it's something we, we absolutely need to we need to avoid uh, but but no education remain absolutely a top priority come what may. Now Theresa May has 
earned some praise for you know, keeping going in the face of some pretty stiff opposition. But I just wonder at what point it looks like she's you know, sticking her fingers in her ears. Because after having to delay the vote, you know, she said she would listen. After having the confidence motion in her leadership, where 117 of her own MPs voted against her, she said she would listen. And yet I can't really detect any sign of her actually changing course in any meaningful way. Have I missed it? The Prime Minister has been listening and, uh, you know, this has been, it's been a very long process. I mean, going through all these negotiations and all, at all stages, the Prime Minister has been listening to, uh, to colleagues in Parliament, of course, to people more broadly as well. And that helps to inform the uh, negotiations. But at the end of the day, there are some conflicting objectives. Not everybody thinks the same thing. And so, you know, in listening, you're listening to different groups and you have to come up with a balanced approach, which works for, you know, which works works for our country, works for all the people in our country, whichever way they voted in the, uh, in the referendum. You've got to think about the interests of uh, fishermen, think about the interests of farmers. You've got to think about the automotive industry and those just-in-time uh, supply uh, lines. You've got to think about uh, the, you know, the, the, the key things that people voted on in that referendum, like ending uh, free movement. And so you end up with a balanced deal, much like the one that she has, uh, she has, she, she has done. But there are okay. also these concerns, understandably, about the backstop, and that's why she's expending all this time and energy working again with the other European leaders to, to secure additional reassurances on that. OK, balanced deal. I've definitely got that memo, so I think we can move on from uh, the uh, balanced deal. Um, we had the uh, confidence motion uh, in the Prime Minister. Uh, at that time, the Conservative Party decided to restore the whip to two MPs uh, who had been suspended. Uh, one of them uh, is still under investigation by police for allegations of sexual offences, something that he denies. Uh, the other uh, was, was resigned after sending hundreds of explicit messages to two women in his constituency, including, I can't wait to beat her, can she take a beating? Are you proud that the whip was restored to those two men? Well, I... In, in those two cases, I mean, those two colleagues, I mean, were elected as uh, Conservative uh, MPs and they're there to represent their constituents. Uh, and so I think it is right that in the, uh, in the election for, uh, you know, so the, 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 the confidence votes uh, that there was, that I think it's right that they should have been able to be part of that vote as their constituents, as their constituents would, would expect. OK, now I'm keen to talk about your brief. We haven't got... Uh too long left on the interview, sadly. Um, you are announcing more money uh, for special needs uh, in school. So just mm. explain to, to us what you're hoping to do and is this new money? Yeah, so there have been, there have been pressures, uh, significant pressures on local authorities' budgets for what's called high needs, which covers special educational needs and disabilities and, and, and some other areas as well. There's been more money actually been going into high needs over the last few years, and particularly since we brought in in 2014 in the Children and Families Act these new education, health and care plans. Uh, and so today we're announcing uh, additional revenue money, a, qu a quarter of a billion pounds over two years, to help to ease some of those funding pressures on the, on the revenue side but also some capital money to, uh, to spend on uh, you know, improved facilities and equipment, things like you know, sensory rooms, uh, to expand uh, SEN units uh, in mainstream schools, things like that. Uh, and also looking to, uh, to be able to provide more places in special schools where that's the right thing uh, for, that, for that child. A number of other reforms as well around training more educational psychologists uh, and, and making sure that we've got the right training in place for all teachers so that all schools are, are best equipped to, to, to be able to to help and support children with special educational needs. Now, of course, we all know about the, the big budget pressures on schools. So is it new money and will it be ring-fenced? So it is, it is money that goes specifically to the high, what's called the high needs block in local authorities and they, they allocate money for, for different, uh, different purposes within special needs. And you ask where the money comes from. No, no other budget is cut in order, to, in order to be able to do this. It's money that's come from the, uh, when we uh, adjust our projections during the course of the year, which happens every year, uh, in terms of the number of pupils uh, in school, the characteristics of different pupils, with the money that's been available from that uh, reprojection, it was my top priority to be able to put additional resourcing towards, uh, towards high needs, special educational needs, and so that, that's what we've done. So not new money then from the Treasury? It's in, in, within the existing schools budget? It is from existing Department for Education budgets, but no other programme has been cut in order to, in order to be able to do this. OK. Um, 
I'm keen to ask you as well about whether there is a wider issue in schools because of the, you know, one size fits all education policy. I mean, we're talking about children with high needs. You know, we know that there's, you know, mental health pressures on our young people. Yes. Do you think in the past there's been too much of a focus on having all children, no matter what their personalities, no matter what their needs, uh, focused on a very academic curriculum where you're expected to be sitting behind a desk for all these hours a day right up to the age of 18? Is that failing our young people? Well, we have a we, we have a very uh, a very good curriculum with some, with balance in it and studying a wide variety of subjects. Like, by the way, schools in other countries as well. There is special provision, rightly, for children with special needs, and, and in some cases, it's right for those children to be in special schools. Although, actually, in very many cases, it's right for them to be in in mainstream schools. But you know, I want to see a broad and balanced uh, curriculum with children being able to try different subjects, try different things, and also the balance with sport and extracurricular activities and so on. And that. And that's absolutely what I'll continue to strive to do. So has there been too much of a focus on exams, do you think? I, I, exams are important. I mean, they're important for lots of different reasons. I mean, what, one, of the, one of the things is, you know, it's, it's a unique way of, of being able to, to set out what you've learned, to show what you can do. Uh, and, and, and that kind of, uh, you, know, you know, what comes with exams, there is some pressure that comes with them, but in some ways that's rather like what happens later in life, and so in some ways it's a good way to prepare you uh, for later in life. But it's not only about exams. You know, what we all want for our children is a broad and balanced education. We want them to discover the joy of learning, to be able later in life to, uh, to come back to, to great literature and history that they've discovered. And we also want them to discover other talents that they have in practical things and in the arts and music and so on uh, and, and I think it's really important that throughout our education system there is absolutely that breadth and we recognise that education yes it's about leaving with GCSEs but it's also about everything else about the development of character the development of self and you also mentioned uh, mental health uh, pressures earlier we also have a greater focus these days on some of the pressures on kids these days that just weren't around when we were when we were children things like from the internet and social media and stuff and yes we do need to, to make sure we have enhanced support for that too.